it's so great to be in this fantastic room. I think we're all very lucky just to be here. Um, but especially I'm happy to be here to celebrate Robert Gulrich's Fall of Princes and to celebrate the author himself. Uh, today is his official publication date. So that's uh, certainly something to celebrate. <laughs> And lucky that the strand got you on your actual pub date. Uh, this is Robbie's third novel and fourth book. His books have been praised in the press and admired by his readers. Uh, he has been number one on the New York Times bestseller list. He's been a bestseller not only in the US, but in France as well and in some other countries. Uh, he's the recipient of the F. Scott Fitzgerald Award for Fiction. His work has been translated into 28 languages. Uh, if I listed them, you would be amazed because they're countries you never even heard of. Um, the new novel is the story of the rise and fall of one of the masters of the universe in New York City in the 1980s. Uh, from the point of view of a, an extraordinarily compelling and complicated character who flew high and fell hard, and I can't wait to hear Robbie talking about him. Uh, the first review of the book uh, this past Sunday was in the Washington Post. Uh, marvels at the book's credibility and poignancy and puts him in the company of Tom Wolfe, Jay McInerney, and Michael Lewis. But they say, Gulrick writes with an immediacy and precision that make this world feel as if it is all his own greatly aided by a finely tuned sense of bleak humor. And for those of you who haven't read the book yet, you will see that in spades. Um, uh, Robbie's going to talk to us tonight about, and I hope he will put this story in context for us with the help of Joan Buck. Um, I think that anything written about this period in New York was written at that time, and I think here we have a character looking back, which is something entirely different, and it's, as Robbie called, as Robbie has said, uh, he is looking at this period recollected in tranquility. I don't know, it's not particularly a tranquil novel. Um, Joan Juliet Buck um, is a writer and performer who has her own book coming out, a memoir, which is coming out next, next year. And she has known Robert Gulrich for 30 years, she says, but she didn't know him, she, uh, she confesses, until she read his books, in particular The Fall of Princes, which, Robbie, she considers your masterpiece. Um, Joan was for seven years the editor-in-chief of Paris Vogue and wrote for the American and and British Vogue for her most of her adult life. Her comic essays can be found in W Magazine and Harper's Bazaar, and um, I think we all have a lot to look forward to. So congratulations, Robbie, and let's do it. Um. I feel like a child. <laughs> um, this novel, more than the story of one person, is the story of the incandescence and extinguishing of a decade, the 80s, in which many people in this room came to our adulthood. And um, the piece I'm going to read you, it was the story of the biggest party that ever was and how quickly it ended. Um, this piece I'm going to read you tonight uh, was written actually as a Christmas present uh, for Bob and Lynn Balaban Grossman. And uh, I have to say one thing, which is that Lynn Grossman is um, my first reader, always. She reads everything I write first. She is my first and best reader. She is uniquely my best critic. She is my good friend and toughest reader. She's my greatest encourager. And it is fair to say that I would not be a writer at all if it were not for her. So I just wanted publicly with you all, all my friends, to thank Lynn. And offer this, offer this little reading as a gift from me through her to you. This is called The Place I Really Live. 
I wake up in the dark. Au bout de la nuit. 406 on the LED. Take a leak. Cigarette. I know I shouldn't. I mean, in general, generally speaking, nobody should. Not after everything we know. Not after we've watched loved ones die. Not to mention movie stars, but I do. I'm an addict, but... I especially shouldn't smoke at 406, but I have a hope of getting back to sleep. It makes my heart race. It makes the heavy covers feel like prison garb. It makes you feel like a cheap bungalow in Los Angeles, California in a noir decade. If I did live in Los Angeles, I would never call it LA. But if I lived in Las Vegas, I would always call it Vegas. <laughs> These are the games your mind plays when it's 407 and your heart is racing from the nicotine intake. I turn on the radio and listen to alternative rock from the University of Pennsylvania for a while. My morning jacket, placebo, Ray LaMontagne, who used to work in a shoe factory, Pink Martini, a 12-member West Coast band that sold 650,000 copies of their self-made CD from their basement. I keep the volume low and I feel completely free of anxiety even though my heart is racing and I'm excited about tomorrow. Tomorrow, or today actually, is the first Tuesday of December. On the first Tuesday of every month, I go look at apartments. I work at Barnes & Noble, and I have Monday and Tuesday off since I work on Saturdays, and I work the late shift on Sundays after I go to church. I go to church every week and put money in the plate, even though I have a long ago lost my faith. I guess it's a kind of hope I feel, a hope that faith and a sense of the miraculous of life will return to me. It hasn't, and the priest's voices drone on in that way that is supposed to be comforting but is actually kind of irritating, but I still go. I sit in one of my decades-old suits in a sea of mink and the finest tailored wool, and then I go to work still in my suit. I am the only clerk in the store who wears hard-soled shoes. Even though it makes my feet hurt, and even though nobody ever looks at my feet, I wear leather-soled shoes every day I work there. It makes me feel more like a member of the professional class and less like somebody who just swipes your card. I'm very fastidious. And the kids in their Barnes & Noble t-shirts think it's weird, but I banter with them. Banter is the word. And I know everything they know about alternative rock, and I'm good at helping them out with the inevitable glitches in their computer cash registers, and we get along just fine. Let's not talk about what I do with my days off on the other three days of the month. Let's not even go into that. I turn the phone off for one thing, even though hardly anybody ever calls me. My sister from upstate once in a while, but let's not go into that. I go to the grocery store and buy a whole week's worth of groceries, even though I mostly eat the dinner De eat in the diner around the corner. I just like the way a full refrigerator looks the endless possibilities. I pay for the groceries with my debit card. At the end of the week, I throw out the stuff that's gone bad and go get other stuff. I take the laundry to the wash and fold, the sheets to the Chinese lady who does them for me. I go to the Metropolitan Museum and look at the same 12 paintings. I have a uh, membership. But it's all just normal. You probably do the same things on your day off. Take your shirts to the laundry, run an errand, take a nap, work in your wood shop, woodworking shop, whatever your hobby is. My hobby is looking at apartments I will never move into. On Monday, I go in and make the appointment. I always dress well, not too well, not a suit or anything, but a nice blazer and a pair of trousers with double pleats, fresh from the dry cleaner, so the pleats are razor sharp. They make you fill out an application, how much you make, what you're looking for, how much you're willing to spend. I always lie. I say I'm a fashion retail executive. If they ask, I'll say I work at Saks. I put down that I make $375,000 a year. I put down an address where I do not live and a phone number that is one digit off my real phone number. It's not like you have to show proof or anything. You could be anybody. Everybody does it, so you don't get the follow-up calls. I give them a fake name. Billy Champagne. A name I heard once in a locker room at a gym I used to belong to. This guy, Billy Champagne, was saying to a friend of his that the only reason he worked out so hard was that he needed something to do with all his energy since he stopped drinking. He said he used to drink a quart of scotch every day before lunch down there on Wall Street and everybody, I swear, 
everybody in the locker room said Jesus under his breath at the same time with the same kind of hushed awe. Billy Champagne was this guy's name, I swear. He was built like a linebacker. He had a beautiful, powerful body and the irony of it never left me so I used his name. I like the name. I'd gladly be Billy Champagne, drunk or sober. I tell them I'm willing to spend $4,500 a month on a one or two bedroom apartment. I say this knowing they'll show me much more expensive apartments anyway. Or I say I'll consider looking at lofts, live in a more open, abstract kind of way. I like to see as many apartments as possible on Tuesday starting at 10 a.m. I don't go to the same realtor more than once every six months. Not that they care. Talk about hope. They live on hope. Hope and greed, these guys. I lie awake in the dark for a long time. I smoke another Marlboro Red. You should see me smoke a cigarette. I do it with a voluptuous finesse. Then I put, out, I put it out in my mother's silver ashtray and turn off the radio right after the U of P goes off the air when the Blue Nile has finished their incredibly moving song because of Toledo. In the song, which pierces my heart every time, people talk about how lonely and misplaced they are. Like a girl in the song, just a girl, that's all we know about her, in this diner, I guess, who's leaning on a jukebox in some old blue jeans she wears, saying wherever it is she lives, she doesn't really live anywhere. I could weep for that girl, a fictional desolation living her one spark of life in a diner in a city I've never been to. Then I hear the line from Shakespeare, and I could sing, would weeping do me good, and never borrow any tear of thee. At 5.30 in the morning, the mind caroms around like a squash ball hitting just above the line and then careening off in some totally unpredictable direction. Just to stop for a minute, the guy in the Miami Herald in his review said that this was clear indication that I didn't know anything about how to play squash. <laughs> To continue, you go from certain brilliance to absolute drudgery in a second. And of course, it's Advent now, and after that comes Christmas, so there's that too. I'd lean on that jukebox with that girl and tell her to cheer the hell up. She has no special claim to desolation, in my view. I go back to sleep until 7.30. I've been awake for an hour and a half. When I wake up, I'm groggy and I'm still tired, but I'm also excited the way I always am. It's a new day. This is the day the Lord hath made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. I say this as I get into the shower. I shave carefully. My hair looks brisk. I dress in clothes that are nice, but not too nice. An investment banker or a lawyer on his day off. Just a blazer and loafers. And then I have coffee. I make a whole pot. Even though I have just a cup and a half, it just looks better, cozier. Then I wash the cup and the pot and pretty much pace the apartment until 10 o'clock. I like to be just a hair late. The real estate office is a new one, very fancy. They have branches all over the city, but they've just opened a branch here because the neighborhood has gotten hot all over again. It's just gone wild, rent shooting through the roof. I wait and then the shower, the shower comes out. That's what they call them, the people who show apartments. My shower's name is Chris Malone. Malone. He wears the nameplate on his shirt pocket. I almost slip, then tell him my name is Billy Champagne. He's maybe 29, not good looking, just a pasty faced Irish boy already going soft around the middle. It's sad to see a person that age look so uncertain in his body. He looks like maybe he drinks too much on a regular basis. He looks like maybe he drank too much just the night before and stayed out too late. He was probably still out when I woke up to smoke, but he's all smiles and he's got a good firm handshake even if his palms are a little sweaty. Six months from now, Chris Malone won't be working here anymore. He'll be selling sporting goods at Paragon. Six months after that, he'll be bartending in the East Village selling double shots at happy hour. He'll move down the food chain so fast and so low, he'll be sucking mud off the bottom of the river. And he'll stay there bottom feeding forever. It's a shame. He should find his youth a pleasure. He should work out and see a dermatologist. He shouldn't drink so much. There's plenty of time for that later. And if he hates his job, and obviously he hates his job, 
who wouldn't? He should find something he likes better before the inevitable something worse finds him. It's not too late. When I was his age, I had a job I loved. It made me feel rich and powerful. Then I just got eaten alive. It was bad at the time, but it's not so bad now. If you go swimming in a river and you know there are piranhas in the river and you got your leg chewed off or something, you can get mad, but you can't get mad at the piranhas. That's what they do. <laughs> so it all changed. I work in a bookshop now. I wear a nameplate like Chris Malone, but I'm an American and I have health benefits and a 401k. And every five years I save up money and go on vacation to a country where I don't know anybody and don't speak the language. And I go first class, the best ever of everything. Cocktails on the veranda at sunset, a view of the local monument. It reminds me of how it all used to be before it all got so fucked up. Without the girls or the drugs or the phone calls. The apartment I had then was beautiful. This wasn't so long ago either. <coughs> It had chic low furniture and the telephone rang all the time and friends dropped over to drink Heineken and leaf through copies of details and wallpaper and talk about whatever it was that was just about to catch the attention of everybody else. Girls with silken skin and slow eyes spent the night there and wore my shirts in the morning when they made espresso in little cups that they would bring to me where I lay naked in bed. The girls who all, who all had great educations and foreign language skills and mostly trust funds had fantastic hair and the kind of bodies you see in Vogue magazine. Then the clock stopped ticking. The spring just snapped one day and the getting stopped and the shocking process of losing began. Not that I have nothing now. I do. I have a lot. You can learn to live with anything. You can do with that so much. It's just irredeemably different and I go out looking for some vestige of my old life on the first Tuesday of every month, although I've learned to get along without it, like an amputee who is a marvel because he's adjusted so well. As Chris this goes through the various checkpoints on the form I fill out, I notice that the cuffs of my white shirt are unbuttoned. My mother once said you could always tell a crazy person because they didn't button their cuffs, but I disagree. I think it makes me look like a rock star from the 60s, like David Bowie in the thin white Duke days. I've seen the pictures. I think you can tell a crazy person because they wear too many clothes in the summer and not enough clothes in the winter. Chris looks eager to help like he smells blood, although I'm betting he wishes he had a shot of vodka and an Altoid to get him through the next couple of hours. I tell him exactly what I want. I want a pre-war building. I don't need a doorman. I need rooms with architectural details. I'd love a fireplace. I want to move because I've gotten bored with my apartment. It's too bland. Although it's nice for what it is, Chris takes notes, then opens a book and begins to shuffle through the listings. He says he's not sure I can get what I'm looking for at that price. I tell him I'm flexible, that the space is more important than the price, within reason. I'll go to 5500 if that's what it takes. I tell him I want a place where I can live for a long time. The thing is, when I'm telling him all these lies, I don't feel fraudulent. I get over that. I got over that a long time ago. I feel an almost erotic thrill deep in my body. I'm wearing hard sole shoes and a Chesterfield coat with a green velvet collar from Turnbull and Asser that still looks almost as immaculate as it did the day I bought it before the clock stopped. To Chris, there's no reason to believe I'm not all the things I say I am. This is America and you can be whoever you want. The streets are full, the Christmas tree people are already out, have been since Thanksgiving, but mostly they're just standing around in these gloves that don't have any fingers on them, drinking coffee and talking with the Korean flower people. Nobody in town is going to buy a tree the first week of December, but hope is just bleeding through everybody's pores, it would seem. Chris has a fine film of sweat at his, at his hairline, even though the day is brisk, despite the bright white sunlight. And he talks on and on about the Knicks and about his girlfriend and about how fast the neighborhood is changing, meaning getting more expensive, filling f with fathers in barber coats and horn rimmed glasses leading their children around to private schools. The sound of his voice is comforting and I feel cheerful and ask all the right questions. I take care to step lightly on the sidewalk. Another 
other thing my mother used to teach us was that a light footfall was a sign of good breeding. I've learned it pretty well, pacing much of the time around my apartment so the downstairs neighbors won't feel they're living in a Edgar Allan Poe story, the telltale heart or something. I expend a great deal of energy trying not to look or seem peculiar. I've been to Phuket, I want to tell sweating Chris, and China. I've been to Cuba, stayed at the Hotel Nacional, stayed at the Ritz in Paris, which makes me the kind of man who stays at the Ritz. I've had more money in my pocket than you have in your bank account most days. His girlfriend works at the Chanel's counter at Saks. She's a makeup artist. I tell him we've never met. Chris keeps walking around, keeps walking toward the first apartment. He's done this yesterday. He did it the day before. As far as Chris is concern, concerned, he's been doing it forever. We look at seven apartments, except that three are in the same building, and two of the, those are identical, just on different floors. A long time ago, I went to a party in one of these apartments, or in the same line as they say. <clears throat> there is something fatally wrong with every one of them. Well, naturally, there has to be. Like, for instance, one has this peculiar 50s miniature oven, so small you could barely fit a chicken into it. Chris asks me if I cook a lot. Oh, yes, I say, I entertain pretty often. This technique is to make some generally, the technique is to make some generally favorable remark when you first walk into at least some of the apartments so that Chris doesn't get too discouraged. And of course, with the first or second apartment, you have to say, Chris, this is exactly the apartment and I don't want, so he knows. S seeing apartments is essentially a sordid business. Looking at an apartment that the tenant hasn't moved out of yet makes me really squeamish. One time I looked at this nice apartment, pre-war, doorman, nice, and the tenant hadn't moved out. And when I opened the bedroom closets, there were all his clothes hanging there, and I realized the tenant was a midget. <laughs> Boy. That was weird, and I imagined myself living this kind of miniature life, never forgetting, <laughs> never forgetting the deformed little suits, the tiny shoes, always feeling like Alice after she's gotten really big. I couldn't get out of there fast enough, and it was rent stabilized and had a working fireplace. <laughs> you spend about 10 minutes in each, each apartment, each redolent with lives, live totally unaware of your own, each filled with the promise of an imaginary life. You might live there where your clothes would go in the closets, where you would put the sofa and the television, and how loud it would be from the street. I always imagine right off where I would put the Christmas tree. I know it's trivial, it's two weeks of the year, and besides, I haven't had a tree for years, not a full size one, just a little table topper, as Christmas, as tacky people say. But I don't know what else you would call it when it sits on a table, and it's even a tree, really. But I try to find a spot and picture a majestic eight-footer covered with all the extravagant ornaments I've saved for my old life, the days when everything glittered too brightly. Somewhere in these lonely rooms there is the ghost of the life I might have lived there. Somewhere there is room for a wife and two or three children and a Sussex Spaniel and barber jackets and travel tickets lying on the kitchen table. In that lovely room I see her. Her hair is colored once a month by the best colorist in the city, tawny blonde with highlights. She's a partner at Debevoy's in Plimpton, and she never cooks, so we eat out all the time or order in. And the three children are in private school, the youngest girl at Spence, the boy at Collegiate, the elder girl at Foxcroft, where we let her go because of her equestrian passions, and face it, she's not ever going to be a Rhodes Scholar. Every morning I kiss them and go off to McCann Erickson, where I'm a global creative director working on some of their biggest accounts. I am pivotal. I am rewarded beyond the common imagination. I see her in another apartment. I see her. She looks sort of like Barbra Streisand at the end of the way we were. And she works as head of one of the departments at the library, and I work at a small publishing house, and we are very leftist, and the children go to the little red schoolhouse, and then on to Horace Mann when they get older. We only have two children. Our hearts would hold a dozen, but that's all we could afford. <laughs> we use our Metro cards all the time, and we take a subscription in the family circle at the Met. And we take the, ch ch and the children grow up to lead lives intense with intelligent ideas and passionate views and commitments.
Every apartment grows other rooms, grows organically into a place where a family could live for years and years. And in every apartment there is always a Christmas tree. It's all covered with beautiful ornaments, Bavarian glass that we have collected over the years and put away with care and never broken any of except that one time the tree fell over, all mixed in with funny kid stuff and a tree topper made out of rhinestones and popsicle sticks that Kate made when she was six and which now fills her with both uncertain pride and mortification every time we take it out and put it right at the very tippy top. In one life, the Plimpton McCann life, we give each other extravagant fur and remote controlled things in Bijou and Bibelot and we leave Christmas afternoon to go skiing in Europe for a week because the airports are empty on Christmas Day. In the library life, we share mittens and scarves and letters of Leonard Wolf and baskets made in third world countries. And then we eat a big dinner in the middle of the afternoon and then we go for a walk in the snowy, almost deserted streets. In one life, we are giddy but anxious. In the other, we are happy, just a happy family. In another apartment, I live with a woman. She is tall with the long, lean body of a swimmer. She is 10 years younger than I am and she wears designer clothes and shoes that cost a month's salary for most people. She is a graphic designer and the apartment is a monument to good taste. We are wholly happy in ourselves and we have no children. I am a writer. I write novels that make people feel better about themselves and they sell quite well. You'd know me if you saw me from the dust jackets. We entertain a lot, actresses, publishers, people from the arts, and we discuss Tristan Zara and the Dadaists and the Le Désert de Retz around Cocovin and Muscadet. She once wrote to me from Paris, you are to me as water to a man dying of thirst in the desert. In any case, every case, we are a tribe, a law unto ourselves, filled with quirks that have come to seem perfectly natural to us. We have the pride of knowing that there is no other group of people in the world with our unique qualities of beauty and intelligence, or kindness, or grace, or strength. We are only wholly ourselves when we are together. Each completes a whole, a part of the whole. But the apartments I look at today couldn't hold any of this. They could hold only me, and I feel bereft every time a door closes behind us. On West 12th Street, we meet another broker with her client at, the double, at a double brownstone. The apartment is composed of the back half of the ground floor and the first floor, what used to be called the parlor floor. The other client is English in his early 30s, and we all go in together and look at this peculiar apartment. He is eating a green apple. We go into the space, as city dwellers say these days, the space. The ground floor is peculiarly divided into two small rooms, one a kind of office and the other the dining room, which looks out onto a large wintry garden. Then there is a handsome galley kitchen with its own washer-dryer combination. There is a treacherous cantilevered stairway up to the second floor, which is perfectly wonderful. There is a ballroom-sized sitting room with 14-foot ceilings. You could have a 12-footer in there, easy. There is simple but elegant plaster molding. The windows look out into the garden and would be just at leaf level in the spring and summer. Behind this, there is a large bedroom which is closed off from the living room by elegant sliding etched glass doors and an art deco bathroom with a real deep cast iron tub. It is all magnificent. I am trembling with excitement. You can feel the weight of the lives lived in these rooms. <clears throat> it has an upstairs and a downstairs like a real house. Once the whole brownstone was home to a single family. Now it is carved up into separate spaces, disparate lives. You can almost hear the rustle of their skirts as the other agent slides the glass doors back and forth. The other realtor turns to her young English client. But where would you put the baby, she asks, and he says exactly, and they leave right away. I want to stay there listening to the sounds of my wife and children watching the tree glisten in the early winter afternoon but my 10 minutes are almost up and I don't want Chris to get overstimulated or he'll never leave me alone. But I can see them, I can smell them, I can lie down in the bedroom rich or poor and sink into the comfort of 20 years of marriage to a woman I love. I can see the posters of the rock stars and the sports heroes on the walls of my children's bedrooms. I am not a fantasist. 
I know the place where I really live. The one room is comfortable to me and it isn't so bad. It is dark and it is small, but it's also pretty much free from memory. There's a lot you can do with a one bedroom apartment if you use your imagination. I know what I do and where I am in the world, which is pretty far down the People Magazine Most Beautiful People ladder. But I want things. Uh, the things I had in another life. I'm sorry I threw it all the way, all the way. I feel terrible about fucking it all up all the time. I want to tell Chris this. I always do, but I don't say anything. I just take another tour through the rooms, remarking mostly on how they cut down these brownstones up into such peculiar ways, and then we leave. I look again at the twinkling tree, so brief, so fragile. I look through the tall windows into the garden where I might barbecue for friends on a summer night. White wine and chev, Diana Krall, the New York Review of Books. I kiss my wife goodbye. I kiss my loving children on their foreheads and Chris and I go back out into the fading sunlight. It's really cold now. The apartment costs $6,000 a month, more than three times what I'm paying now. On the way back to the office, I tell Chris that his job must be very frustrating, showing all these apartments to people who are so hard to satisfy. He says that it's okay, he likes people. He says he has one client who's been looking for an apartment <clears throat> for five months. He says he just takes it one day at a time. That's the way you ought to take it, pal, I think. One day at a time. I shake his hand. I promise I'll call him tomorrow. I walk home through the chill afternoon, passing the tree stand again. Maybe this year, I think. Maybe next week. The windows we look through to glimpse the happiness of families. All the rooms we might have lived in. All the lives we might have led. Thank you. It's on. No, I, talk for a while. <laughs> I love that chapter. Sorry. Are we taking questions from the people? Or we you're taking questions from me. Okay. And then when you're bored with that, you're taking questions from people who aren't me. Is that okay? Mm -hmm. How do I turn this on? It's on? I think it's on. It's on? Okay. That's such a beautiful chapter, and it has this extraordinary thing of the, the imaginary life, which is all the way through the book. The aspiration, okay, I'm not gonna describe your book to you, because that doesn't work for me. But I noticed in the French reviews, you've been compared to Martin Scorsese and Oliver <laughs> Stone, which, which is really interesting because there is, there's no attempt in your book to be cinematic. There's no scenes, there's no guns. There's no drama like that. But you paint an entire picture of a world through Rooney's desires. And there's nothing you can possibly say to that, so I will continue. <laughs> Um, one of the French reviews said, with the fall of princes, Robert Gorick has written one of the greatest novels on America and money since The Magnificent Gatsby. The, 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 French, were, the, the French are very funny. <clears throat> They look at this novel, they looked at it as an indictment of capitalism. Would you say that's true, Joan? It's, well, 
they're dying to read a decent indictment of capitalism. Right, right. I mean, look at Piketty, you know. You're and like the novel version of Piketty. And I think um, American reviewers um, are wary of it for that very reason, that it's an indictment of capitalism. But I think what it, to me, what it is, is an indictment of vulgarity more than an indictment of the actual system of money. Well, I mean, of course, we are at a moment when somebody who embodies both capitalism and vulgarity is very much in the news. <laughs> but um, I don't know that... I think it, it, it... I think it's very much... Especially when Rooney goes to become a banker, I think it's very much like the opposite of Plato's Republic, where you have to, you know, you train a leader from very, very young to to know how to think coherently for the good of everyone. And I want to get you to talk about the the scene when Rooney is hired. You describe a world you. It's not that you describe, you bleed a world where greed and, what do we even call it? Uh, Self-gratification and self-gratification through things are, are what takes, the, are what eats the hero's heart. So it's the Faustian bargain with capitalism. Well, he says from the beginning, he says we were not nice people. He says that he, he regretted, even as he lived the life that he lived in the 80s, that he regretted doing it. Um, the interesting thing about how he um, got his job, and I don't mean to read the book for you here, but um, he... Um, the he he works um, in on Wall Street in a firm that is never mentioned, that is never named in the book, but is in fact Goldman Sachs. <laughs> um, and when I worked in advertising, I did the advertising for Goldman Sachs for several years, and um, and um, there's a, a very fascinating book called The Culture of Success, which is a history of Goldman Sachs. And there was a time at Goldman Sachs um, when people were hired, the chairman of Goldman Sachs had sort of come up by his bootstraps to be cha the chairman of Goldman Sachs. And he would go out and grab sort of young men off the street whom he found to be bright, energetic, eager, you know, boot blacks or newspaper boys or whatever. And he would take them into his office and he would play a hand of poker with them. And he would hire them uh, based on the way they played a game of a hand of poker. And that's really true. That is an actual fact. At what and, period? Hmm? Is this like early 20th century? Yeah, or? early 20th century. Okay. And um, so this is before the accountants took over and started crunching the numbers, you know, and it all got to be logarithms and degrees from Wharton and all of that. It was much more seedier pants. And, but those people who were hired by playing a hand of cards were the people who made Goldman Sachs the world power that it was. And it was all about how your face, what, your, what showed in your face as you played the cards you were dealt. And that's how you got hired at Goldman Sachs. And I never forgot that detail. And the ones who are the, the real hedonists and the real wolves in this book are the ones who win the hand of poker. And uh, I relied very heavily on my friend Gene Orza, who is a ace at poker, um, to provide me with certain hands of poker that would be interesting to read about um, and show cleverness on the part of the wannabes. Um, I'd like to read something from the book. Okay. You don't have to. Um, it's from page five. It's, it's the confession, almost. 
save for the hum of money with other young men just like us, our inner lives obscured by insatiable greed, and we let our increasingly dubious virtues grow tangled and overgrown with layer after layer of objects, things, always things, suits that cost more than our fathers paid for their first houses, cars of exuberant finesse and mountains of speeding tickets that we got racing out to the eastern end of Long Island where we kept the pools heated year round. Extravagance, vulgarity, it's such an extraordinary thing that leads later to your confession, Rooney's confession, which kind of like Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who confessed absolutely everything, including that he changed his faith to get into the good graces of some rich people. Um, when you wrote this amazing thing, forgive me for thinking I was better than you will ever be. There are pages and pages of this confession, including the confession to the blonde girl. Rooney confesses to the blonde girl who he left. I mean, left in a restaurant. Yeah. Did that? Did you ever go through something like that? Did I do it? Yeah, did you do it? No, no, no. I have better manners than that. <laughs> because it's... But it was typical, it was certainly possible in the 80s to behave that way. Isn't it still possible today? Probably, but I'm not of, I don't know, probably. Um, Why did it start to be possible in the 80s? Because I think people began to be so self-obsessed in the 80s. And it came through having, you see, I, I mean, I were, the, people ask me why the book isn't about advertising since I worked in advertising yeah. as opposed to Wall Street where I didn't work. And it's because advertising was sort of Wall Street's bastard stepchild, you know. Wall Street was truly the zeitgeist of the decade. And, um, and advertising was its kind of weaker cousin. Um, we too rose too high and made too much money and raced out to the eastern end of Long Island where we kept the pools heated and all of that. And, you know, um, we were capable of those excesses. We just didn't, we weren't capable of it to the, to the degree that they were on Wall Street because we didn't get a million dollars at the end of the year. You know, we just didn't get that level of, of um, overwhelming financial excess. And we didn't have that control over the culture. I mean, that, we, that control over the, over the money. But we you had, had the control over the culture. We had tremendous control over the culture. And that gave us a great deal of hubris that we didn't deserve to have. I had this wonderful woman who worked for me named Anita Madeira. And she once said to me that uh, all of her artist friends wanted to work at advertising and all of her advertising friends wanted to be artists. And it was because um, her artist friends saw that, uh, would work on a show for months and months and months and months and months and it would hang for a month and maybe, let's say, 800 people would see it. And their friends in advertising would work on a commercial for two months and it would run on the Super Bowl and 800 million people would see it and artists did not have that kind of impact on the culture that we had. Um, except that you were selling something. Except that we were selling something. And but, the, and but the rewards were really ridiculous. I mean, I was hired at 23 and at 23 there I was staying in the Beverly Hills Hotel across the hall from Lauren Hutton on somebody else's money, you know. I mean, I suppose Hollywood had the same kind of thing happen. I suppose there were pockets of it, there are pockets of it all over, of that kind of degree of instantaneous too muchness. But it was true, certainly true on Wall Street, it was true in advertising, it's true in Hollywood that, you know, when success hits, it hits hard and it hits fast and you can really get out of control with it. So, 
I want to go into that, but first I'd like you to define autofiction because we talked the other day. Ah. And so this is a novel that is... True. The um, autofiction is a... Is, um, well, it's a term the French use, and it's basically a novel uh, in which, er, in which, which is about the, which is a fiction about the author's life, in which everything is true. Does that make sense? Um, and I write books, and everything in the book is about me. The stories are true. Um, but they're all fictionalized. So, even though I would say that Rooney is definitely me, he's also very much not me. I mean, I never left a girl in a restaurant. I never raced at tea stamped and I never kept the pool heated. But it was certainly in me to do all of those things. And I knew people who did them. And in the book, the book is filled with stories about the people I knew in those days and the acknowledgments which go on forever in this book um, say that the book was written um, as um, a letter of tenderness to the sweethearts and darlings of my youth. It's my last attempt to say to the people I loved when I was young how much I love them and to confess to you um, and to one person in particular that they're really, people think I live a loveless life, but I don't. And that there was in fact one person whom I loved above all else and that this is my last attempt to say I love you and um, I don't know that I'll write another novel like this although I think all of my books in a way I think writers only have one every writer only has one or two things to say and I have struggled since I started writing to try to come up with what that one thing is. And I think, I, I think finally after four books that it's clear to me that the one thing I have to say is I love you. That's as close as I can come to what it is. If, if, you ha if a writer has to put his message on, a t on his tombstone, that's what it's going to say on mine. I also despise you. <laughs> so it's a, it's a it's a little hard. Well, wait. I, as I said to somebody yesterday, as I said to somebody yesterday, you know, being bipolar is not easy. <laughs> um, I'm, that is so beautiful. And I just want to interrupt you with a quote from the book. Forgive me for thinking that I was better than you will ever be. Forgive me for thinking that money equaled a kind of moral superiority. Forgive me for not thinking enough about the plight of the poor, the terrible lassitude that overtakes them the moment their feet hit the floor. The poor only bet on losing horses. They only give up things they never get until there's nothing left to part with, nothing of any value except for a faded photograph of their mother and father's wedding, a small figurine given to them on the boardwalk on one happy day of a lifetime of unending sameness. This is a veiled attack on my mother. <laughs> Do go on. And the reason it's a veiled attack on my mother is because... <laughs> See, the problem is, the problem is once you've written a book like The End of the World as We Know It, <clears throat> when people ask you a question, you're sort of bound to answer honestly. You're sort of bound to, answer, to give an honest answer, you know. And I was about 28 years old and um, 
making a surprising, a startling amount of money for a 28-year-old, and or so I thought. Can you excite us with the figure? I was, hmm? Figure? <laughs> Oh, Times are hard. I don't remember, but it was, uh, I know that it was more than my father was making. Let's, let's put it that way. So, my father was a college professor. Um, and I bought at Bergdorf's a red cashmere sweater on sale for $100 in, so it would have been in 1976. And um, I wore it in Virginia when I went home. And my mother attacked me about buying a cashmere sweater, as though there was something morally wrong with having a cashmere sweater. And she really humiliated me. And she really, really, really took this stance. It was very brief, but it was so withering and condescending. And, um, and obviously I had the thing on, so, you know, so it, it's not like, you know, it's not like you go like, fat, you know. Um, and I've never forgiven her for, for, for this attitude that poverty, she, she um, ran a household and my father gave her $300 a month to feed a family of five. And she kept the book, she kept the household money in a book called The Pleasures of Poverty. <laughs> and, um, and, she thought that was a kind of ironic piece of wit, you know. But fuck her. <laughs> Poverty has no pleasures, you know. And a cashmere sweater does offer pleasures. And I, it's not that a cashmere sweater is morally virtuous, but neither is poverty, you know. And, and, and so that little passage in the book is a kind of attack on my mother about how it's, 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 it's not a virtuous thing. It's not necessarily a virtue. The poor are not necessarily virtuous just because by virtue of their poverty. Let us segue from that into Rooney's regrets about all the things that are gone. Well, he regrets his, everything. His gold Rolex, his Mercedes CLK, the Schnabel, the trainer at six who ran his finger across our brow and tasted the sweat, then told us what and how much we had to drink well, the that night did before. Happen. That did happen. But all of that, that fabulous, that, that sort of erotic consumption and overconsumption of the finest things leads to this terrible sentence, something that Rooney is regretting, my tables at Christmas littered with cards, most of them from shopkeepers. <laughs> This well, that's true. <laughs> I only get Christmas cards from people in shops. Well, that's because nobody sends Christmas cards anymore. I'm trying to cheer you up. Is it working? <laughs> it's not working. Okay. <laughs> Buy a lot of books. That'll cheer me up. <laughs> um, but you are terribly funny. There are lines in here, the Bel Air was dull as toast points. Well, you know, I mean, there's nothing wrong with being funny. I don't think. And there's nothing, you know, my friend, I don't know, I don't know. I'm sorry, I seem to have dragged you into the mud and this book is No, 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 you haven't at all. You've dragged me into sort of introspection. But oh, let's get out of there. But, um, <laughs> okay, let's get out of there. You rats the size of watermelons. The liquor washed me clean. Um, I did live in that apartment. I have to Hubble say. Hall? Hubble Hall. I did. And anybody who knew me then will know that I did live in that apartment. And there are some people in this room who have actually been in Hubble Hall and remember it. Hubble Hall was on 35th Street. It was a fifth floor walk up. 
And the first floor was a Spanish restaurant, and the second floor was the Chinese whorehouse. And the third and fourth What's particular floor, about a Chinese whorehouse? What's particular about Yeah, how could you tell? I mean, well, there were all these Chinese hookers and <laughs> people coming and going. And so that was that. And then on the top floor was Hubble Hall, and it was a one bedroom apartment, and people came to dinner, and it had been rented before me by two gay waiters who, uh, from the Westchester Country Club. And so when I moved in, they, for some reason, vanished to Florida and left it empty and sublet it to me for $100 a month in 1974. And I moved in and they never reappeared. And one thing they left behind was um, service for about, I would say, 70. Uh, all lifted from the Westchester Country Club. <laughs> so... Thick porcelain. Yeah. Unshippable. Yeah. Um, porcelain cups, saucers, plates, knives, forks, everything. So those were in the 70s when, if you remember, the garbage strike was the norm in New York. John Lindsay was mayor. And in general, garbage was piled higher than the ceiling on every street corner in New York City. So uh, I would entertain in Hubble Hole, and people would huff and puff up the stairs and get there. And it was truly, 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 truly desolation row. But anyway, it was filled with crockery and uh, forks and knives and spoons. And we would have dinner, and instead of washing the dishes, we would throw everything out the window so. onto the street because it could hardly be differentiated from the trash that was already there. And there was so much of it that it, it was a never-ending supply and um, it was so much easier than washing the dishes. What about the danger to the passers-by? We made sure it was. We made sure that there was no. There, there was. There were only hookers, but we made sure that they had. That they had passed by. We never killed anybody. I want to go back to how you said this book is just saying I love you. There's so much tenderness in the book for the women in Rooney's life, but also the colleagues. The, the, the fellow traders, when you, the boys who die of AIDS, everyone is a casualty. It's, this book is, I don't know, it made me think of um, Paradise Lost, if Satan could write his autobiography on the way down. Well, the 80s was a big, big, big party that left the landscape littered, littered with casualties. But the descriptions, the tenderness with which you describe these people, uh, Wheatcroft, Conti, a young trader who does six all-nighters in a row and then his heart explodes in his chest. That happened. That happened just this year at a trading firm downtown. <coughs> a man who set up a young boy, young 22-year-old, set up a cot in the boiler room at a firm and spent night after night after night after night there and his heart exploded. This happened just this year. And this kind of culture is coming back. So this book is more timely than you might think. It's all starting again. Oh, this book's an absolute description of the present without AIDS. And as I say, you know, uh, I have a great fondness in this book and he's treated very kindly for Trotmeyer. Trotmeyer who gets pulled into the love affair? Yeah. Tell, tell everyone about Trotmeyer. Well, Trotmeyer is, um, is one of the gang. One of the traitors. And, um... He, and um, this is the truest of the stories in the book. And um, he's he, really good looking, right? He's really, really good looking. He's a Greek god. And um, he is in, he's living with a girl who designs sweaters for Ralph Lauren. And they're and, engaged. And they're sort of engaged. And 
then she moves to Calvin Klein and then she goes home to her mother to discuss the wedding and while she's gone a friend of his Vetus Gerolitis calls him up in the middle of the night and says I've got a girl for you and he says I'm engaged and Vetus says get dressed put on nice clothes stand on the street and I'm sending a car for you in 10 minutes and so it goes down to the street and a car pulls around the corner Vetus had a um, yellow Rolls Royce and this yellow Rolls Royce pulls around the corner and an arm the door opens an arm reaches out and there's a glass of brandy in the hand and of a woman's arm and he takes the brandy drinks it and gets in the car and there is a one named diva it says in the book um, and he gets in the car and they have this mad love affair and he tells the diva that um, it has to be absolutely secret that nobody can ever 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 know that um, they're having this affair because he's engaged to this very nice ordinary girl and um, next thing he knows the ordinary girl is in the checkout line at Ralph's in Los Angeles and sees a picture of Trottenmeyer with the diva in the National Enquirer dancing at Studio 54 and that ends their uh, engagement and um, and he becomes very ordinary and he becomes very ordinary but he never loses his luster really Anyway, um, that story is true. Every page in the book is so lucid and so sharp and so infinitely sad and so infinitely truthful that you kind of, as you read it, you kind of go, eek, eek, eek. The description of the memorial service for Alan, the designer, who dies of AIDS and he has the big memorial at the New York State Theater and you've got a very short but beautiful description of it and but some of us were there but it ends with and Alan glamour and death Eros and Thanatos glamour and death sooner or later some side would win one side would prove stronger than the other and Alan would be largely forgotten in the way that the 500 guests so used to going to openings and book parties at the houses of people they didn't really know would wake up the following morning and wonder while the coffee dripped exactly how they had spent the last evening What's There's a line in the book I like which says um, sooner or later we're all yesterday's newspaper and I think that was true. I mean, one thing that happened in general in the 80s was there were so many people dying so fast that um, you couldn't take it all in. You just really couldn't take it all in, I think. Before we open this to the public, I just to the public, no, to the, uh, <laughs> to the guests. Right, I, I wanted to say that maybe we could take a couple of questions. Sure. We've and the, and then Robbie time. might want, some people might want Robbie to sign their books. And um, uh, Joan, thank you for pulling out some of the extraordinary pieces of Robert Gulrich for us. <laughs> That's because Robert Gorick's extraordinary. <laughs> <laughs> so if anybody as, my any as my friend Sally Mann says, I'm just an ordinary artist making ordinary art. It's important to remember for you and you and you and you and you and you and you, and you all of us. So okay. if anybody has any questions, uh, just raise your hand and I'll bring you a mic. Down Jim, the hand. Jimmy. Um, okay, Robbie, hi. Yes, sir. Hi, hi, hi. Um, I just wanted to ask you a really general question. How long were these books you're writing cooking up before you started writing them? Your whole life? Um, while you were working in advertising? Yeah, I think so. I think um, people always told me that I should be a writer. And I didn't really know either what to write about. And 
And what I didn't know, what I really didn't know, and this is why I meant to praise my friend Lynn so much, is I didn't know how to write like I talk. And people kept saying to me, if only you could write like you talk. And then one day, I, I, I got fired from advertising. And I had sort of lost everything and reached the end of my rope. And um, I had nothing left to lose. So I just sat down and let it all go. And, and suddenly, in a flash, uh, learn to write like I talk and I think that's what saved me but the books most of them had been cooking around for years I remember sitting at a party probably 15 years ago and saying that I was saying to some woman I didn't really know that I was gonna write a book called the fall of princes I didn't really know what it was about <sighs> but I knew that I was gonna write a book called the fall of princes and I still lived in New York and I haven't lived in New York for eight years so it was at least 10 years ago and I I don't mean to say I'm a spiritualist or anything but I sort of heard this voice and it said Lucy Childs and I thought do I know somebody named Lucy Childs and I don't and so now I'm writing a novel about a little 12 year old girl named Lucy Childs it takes a long time for it to bubble up in me but it does the seed is planted and then I don't know how long it's going to take for it to germinate but it does eventually amazing and you talk and write beautifully and I'll never forget when I was in a bookstore and I saw your books that I saw the end of the world uh, as as we know it and I saw Robert Gulwick on it and I was just absolutely floored and <laughs> happy and overwhelmed and overjoyed thank you thank you thank you Jimmy one more in the back here. Thank you. Um, I'm curious about um, how you were thinking about a reliable wife, which is a historical and a brilliant, brilliant, wonderful novel. I, it's just absolutely wonderful. And how you worked at that and how you worked at this, which is a contemporary novel, and very much, as you're saying, about your life. Um, what part of your life maybe went into a reliable wife? Uh, it, I'm very curious. It, it's just startling to read that novel, and um, it stays with me all the time. It's I a, think a beautiful that novel. The thing that, uh, if there's anything that's in common in my books, it's about, um, for instance, let's say, Reliable Wife is about um, bad people to whom good things happen. <laughs> and Heading Out to Wonderful is about good things to whom bad things happen. Uh, but, and all three of my novels are, to me, to me at least, and that doesn't mean it's the same, tr it's true for you, but to me they're about redemption. I think I, I, I strive in my own life for some sort of redemption that I feel I have to earn or I need to try to find. And um, I think that's true of the characters in my book. In Reliable Wife, they're very much, um, all of them, um, striving for redemption. And the thing I found in that book, and I think the thing I, uh, that makes me both proud of it and also a little sad for it, is that you can't save everybody in the book. You just can't. So. Yeah. Of course, I'll sign books for anybody who yeah, wants. I think we should just get Robbie to start signing before we... Uh, so thanks everybody and thank you so much to Robert and Joan.